Thank you, Sarah. Right, um, I'm not going to disappoint you because I don't want to talk about gluten by itself. But for what I heard, I want to bring home so many of the concepts that you heard today. And as a preamble, two minutes. That's it? Yeah, no. Oh, jeez. Okay, <laughs> I thought that I was going fast. I, that was fast. <laughs> I tell you, that's right. Um, I want to just uh, you know, put out there uh, to make sense of what I'm going to discuss in a, in a moment, the fact that few centuries ago, life expectancy was 32 years. Now in industrialized countries, we're talking about roughly 80 plus. This is, was all driven by proper nutrition. Next generation, first time ever in the past few centuries, will have a lower life expectancy of our generation. Why? Nutrition again. So keep that in mind while we go through uh, you know, this kind of concept that I'm trying to put everything together what you heard today. The, there is now a better understanding of the recipe that brings people from a state of health of the state of disease. Talk about immune media diseases. It's not just talking about serious disease or talking problem with gluten. I'm talking about cancer. I'm talking about behavioral issues, I'm talking about heart attack. Uh, of course, infections and autoimmune diseases, they have an immune component because these are all commonly linked by a process of inflammation. We knew that, of course, who you are, genetically speaking, will really impinge what is your final destination. And most definitely, the environment is important. And in that, nutrition is a key element that you will see in a moment, much more than just consider nutrition as fuel it's much more than that. Um, there is another element. I'm a gastroenterologist by training. I can't really, uh, you know, um, dot it, put in there the fact that these two worlds, who we are genetically and the environment impinge on us, need to physically interact. And the gut, that is pretty much the largest interface that we have, is the port of entry where these environmental triggers come in and eventually will lead to the clinical outcome. Of course, the immune system is important. But today, I want to really discuss about these new elements. You've been living on Mars, if you didn't hear the microbiome, and you're really out of touch if you don't know about that. But you know what it is, it's still vague, and I believe few people really appreciate what the microbiome is all about and how nutrition really can impinge on it. And this leads to the clinical outcome. I don't think in this audience I have to explain what is the hygiene hypothesis. This is a use that boosts slides many times. Anybody does not know what is the hygiene hypothesis? Everybody does? Should I revisit this in a second? No? Yes, no, 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 okay. So this was an interesting theory that was put out there almost 20 years ago in which people compared really the 50 years time frame in which we went after the uh, uh, major killers of humankind, uh, infections, and being very effective, as you see in the left hand side of the slides, in bringing down mortality and you know, rates of rheumatic fevers, hepatitis A, and so on, TB, mouth missiles, and so on and so forth. However, during the same time range, we create the syndicates for epidemics of immune-mediated diseases like MS, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, asthma, to the point in which now this is really a new epidemic. It's not you know, slowing down. If anything, it's accelerating. And this is happening only in industrialized countries, not you know, sub-equatorial countries. However, if somebody from you know, developing countries will migrate to our latitudes, they will have the same kind of phenomenon. So, and that's, you know, brought this hygiene hypothesis. We're too clean for our own goods and now we are paying a price that we have these issues in terms of, you know, these epidemics of conditions. This is the most frightening of all the epidemics that I've never seen. The time frame is not 50 years anymore, it's 25. And this is the epidemics of autism that we're seeing in our countries. In only 25 years, we went from one in 5,000 to one in 68, this is the last number, not 88, 68, number the CDC. If you consider the male-female ratio is four to one, next generation, one out of four boys will be lost to autism. Definitely, the timeline cannot 
blame genetics for these epidemics. We are changing the environment way too fast for our bodies to adapt. The same for food anaphylaxis or food allergies. There is a rampage in a relatively short period of time of these kind of consequences. When I was in training, and I'm darn young, so it was not long ago. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Um, the paradigm was you develop food allergies, particularly cow's milk protein tolerance. By year one, the vast majority of people will, will grow out of it. We see now people developing these allergies later in life. Type 1 diabetes, once upon a time, was called juvenile diabetes. We have to drop off that nomenclature because you can develop type 1 by diabetes of 40 and 50. Celiac disease was considered a condition of childhood. You can develop celiac disease in the 70s. What is going on? What is happening that all this is changing completely the right trend? This is a study that really bothers us a lot showing that in the United States, the incidence of celiac disease double every 15 years. We were under the impression that if you're genetically predisposed with the genes to develop celiac disease and you ingest grains containing gluten that happen 100% of us by the time the baby food is introduced, the two key elements, necessary sufficiency are together, you develop celiac disease. If this manifests right away or manifests later in life, we thought, was depending how aggressive the immune system to put you over the edge. The target organ is not small. It's 20 feet long in an adult. And therefore, you have to have a critical mass of damage in the intestine in order to develop these symptoms. This hygiene hypothesis has been recently put up for challenge because in countries in which IG was not implemented, like you know, South America, the North Africa, you know, countries and, and some other countries in the Middle East. Now that their gene is being implemented, they don't see these epidemics. They don't. So we don't believe that the hygiene hypothesis explains this all. Of my talk, I have 17 slides. One slide a minute. This is the most important. So if you got distracted before, or you need to go to the bathroom, hold on just for a second while we go through the slides, and then just leave it, leave it. If you're lucky, you are on the life side of this slide. You're born as Mother Nature decided that we have to be born with vaginal delivery. I can't emphasize enough proper nutrition. You've been fed the way that we evolved as a species, no infections very little, no use of antibiotics. If you did that, the outcome is to really develop an ecosystem, a microorganism that we now know live in symbiosis with us from birth to life, to death, i.e. the microbiome in good balance. Now, this is not my interpretation, it's factual. The microbiome is the trainer in the first three years of life of how we really unleash our weapons when we are under attack. The immune system is trained mainly by the microbiome. An immune system developing, speaking, onto, in ontogenesis will develop to fight one single enemy, infections. We as a species, classically, we're used to die either because a predator will eat us or infection will kill us. It's only recently that the immune system has to fight many other you know, enemies never been seen during, you know, evolution, pollutant, chemicals, you know, radiation. You heard, you know, some of them today. Now, if you do the job right and you train the immune system right, the threshold where you unleash these tremendous weapons with this collateral damage that we call inflammation, they create an unfriendly environment for microorganisms to grow, will be set very high when really, really we are under danger. If we do that, and, and therefore we train the immune system properly, we stay healthy. And, and mainly because no matter what kind of genes we have, we unleash this inflammation only when we really have no alternative. Now, if you're out of luck, you're on the right side of this slide. You're born by C-section. You got in your mouth, God knows what, but not food. Uh, you know, you know. For example, you go to the freezer section of a supermarket and buy, you know, the dinner tray. We have no idea what's in there. 
Uh, you got multiple infections, you really had, you know, bombarded by antibiotics. This leads to a total imbalance of your ecosystem of microorganisms, what we call dysbiosis. Now, this will train the immune system to set that threshold very, very low. So you unleash inflammation even when it's not needed. What is the price that you pay, depending on genetically you are, you will develop those immune-mediated diseases that I told you, even when the meniscus stimulus comes from the environment. Now, I should make a quiz here, but I don't have the time, but also the, 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 the venue doesn't require this. Of all these elements that dictate the composition of the microbiome, the way you're born is a one shot that happened once in your lifetime. Infections and antibiotic use are occasional elements. You eat three, four times a day. The microorganism that makes the microbiome, they need to eat. They eat whatever we eat. You eat junk, you have a microbiome out of balance. You eat wealthy and healthy, you will be definitely in a better shape. Now you can go to sleep. <laughs> so I don't want to spend too much time because I have only four minutes, but you know, again, the microbiome is such a buzzword now. For us, they've been studying for decades this interplay between us and microorganisms. It came out a surprise because we didn't know there was this hidden world. 95% of the microorganisms live with us are not cultivable, and therefore we didn't even know that they exist. Now we know there is a wealth, they got a zillions of them. For each cell that we have, there are 10 microorganisms living with us, and so on and so forth. So, and these cannot be just, you know, folks that they are sitting there. They talk with us all the time. There is an ongoing crosstalk that has a tremendous impingement of who we are to the point in which people, they only believe that if you develop cancer or obesity, it depends on the microbiome. The way that you behave, at least animal models suggest the way that you behave may be dictated by the microbiome. We had a proof of concept of all this, you know, studying in deep celiac disease in which, you know, you have some variables a little bit more under control. And we learn the inexplicable, that is the following. The fact that you're born with the genes to develop breast cancer, Alzheimer, high blood pressure, heart attack, celiac disease, it doesn't mean that it's destiny. You got the short stick of life evolution by got these genes. Because your mom and dad gave it through the human genome that kind of gene asset. But if you do or do not develop these diseases, in other words, if genetic potential translate in factual or not, totally depends on this microbiome. A parallel world that again, is an area that if you're lucky, but from your mother changed from uh, time to time in the same individual and so on and so forth. If you're lucky, come from, from your mother by vaginal delivery. I said, this is good. If you're born by C-section, the chance to develop an autoimmune disease like CD disease or diabetes is five times more. Why? Take a look at the slides. In green is the microbiome in the mouth of the mother, just as a control. Pink is your microbiome if you're born by vaginal delivery that resemble mom's vaginal and intestinal microbiome in red. That doesn't casually stays there. This has been highly selective for mom to stay there. If on the other end you're born by C-section in light blue, your microbiome is the skin microbiome of your mother. That is casual. All comers, people in the operating room, uh, uh, the nurse and so on and so forth. And some of these microorganisms cannot be good for you. So bottom line, let me finish up by saying that, you know, the human genome is extremely rudimental. When the human genome project was, you know, concluded, my self-esteem went to the toilet, learning that we are at the very bottom of the complexity of genetics of human, I mean, of being on the face of the earth. Only 25,000 genes. The worm that we're going fishing with, 75,000. <laughs> the plant that made gluten, 150,000. 25,000 genes. How do you explain the complexity of who we are? Well, the human genome is like a piano with 25,000 notes. And let's say that you have to extract 300 notes to play the song CD Disease. Depends on the piano player. And the piano player that is highly influenced the way that we eat is the microbiome. You have Elton John that may touch two of the 300 notes. You don't play the song CD Disease or Diabetes or Alzheimer or whatever it is. But now, you know, again, you eat miserably. 
You take a lot of antibiotics. You have stress in life. You take, you know, a trip to Cancun as I did, you know, last yesterday, and you got toasted. Whatever. <laughs> now you have Chopin that can now with this virtuous attitude touch all 300 notes, and you play the song "Silly Disease." And now we have a way to predict who's playing the song by doing this multiomic analysis, particularly to look at the metabolites. So if we look at the metabolites and we read the pop song, song, that means that you are safe. But if at some, at some point the song changed in classic, you know the wrong microbiome is sitting and your specific genetic makeup, you can be in trouble. So the model to move this the early childhood nutrition and on health and adulthood is not a cliche anymore. The way that we feed the generations to come will really impinge on what is the heart and soul to really live long and happy life. In other words, to have preventive medicine, preventing rather than fixing. So prenatal factors, childhood factors, this really impinge on who you're going to be as an adult. I put this not because you have to read. It's an unreadable slide, and I hate when people they do that. But it's just to say prenatal, perinatal, and postnatal factors, they all impinge on who we are, and the crossroad is, again, nutritionally in influence the microbiome. This is the last slide. The NIH really appreciate that this is where the future and trusted with this study that we call the CD disease genome, environmental microbiome and metabolism study, CDGEM. The goal of this is to have a crystal ball, to take these kids at risk for CD disease and see who will eventually start to play the wrong song and make sure that the piano player will be changed before it's too late so that we can prevent rather than fix. Thank you so much.